Welcome again to our lesson module two. Uh, we're going to now deal with lesson module two. For more further reading for lesson module two, please consult the study guide, pages 10 to page 23. The, in, that, in those pages, we have detailed explanation of what is this all about? So if from what I'm saying, you feel like uh, you need more to read and try and have a better understanding, please consult those portions. Lesson module two is all about the overview of the UNFCC Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement. These are intergovernmental climate change policies. The UNFCC, we normally call it the convention. The Kyoto Protocol, uh, we will hear more about it, and the Paris Agreement. Now, in this particular point, we will try and you know, provide an overview inside of what are these treaties? What are basically the processes of these treaties and what are they doing? Now, let's go to the outline. Well, with the outline, we start briefly with the history of the climate change. We're doing a brief history. It's a long history. We probably wouldn't be able to cover it in any of the time giving. So we'll just give an insight. Then we'll go to the framing. How are these treaties framed? What are their policies? Which will be the UNF C, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement. Now, these treaties, they also have institutional arrangements which are established in the treaties to support the implementation, to support the negotiation. But on top of that, the treaties, they also establish bodies that will help them to advance the negotiation. And these bodies are not permanently established by the treaties, but they are established by the conference. There are also other intergovernmental organizations which are assisting to advance the implementation of climate change. So this is what we'll be talking about uh, briefly. Uh, so let's move on. And then we look into the overview of the UNFCCC uh, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and the Intergovernmental Climate Change Policy. We see that this Intergovernmental Climate Change Instrument started with a non-legally binding, which was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, when it was uh, adopted in 1995. It was realized that it is not a legally binding uh, instrument. Then members of the convention, which are normally called parties, then decided that no, we need to go to the next level of a legally binding instrument. But at this particular time, and in the, for industrialized countries, as they were implementing it, these parties realized that no, it is not enough to only set legally binding instrument for industrial countries because even developed countries are beginning to be more industrialized. Some of them are more industrialized than the industrialized countries. I hope you will understand what I mean as they grow their economy. There are a number of them. We know them. We, we can give an example like China. China is a, a developing country, but uh, in a sense, it is more developed than any developing country and even more developed than some of the developed countries. So then parties decided now, no, let's go to a hybrid now, you know, where we will look into different things and allow all the countries to take part. And for this, they use what is called national determined contribution which is a domestic policy for all countries 
to raise their ambition, their actions, their adaptation, how they cope into, including their financial, the financial force, which helps developing countries. Okay, let's move on then. Well, this is basically, the picture is basically showing the problems that we had talked about before earlier on as a result of global warming. And there we are, we're looking so confused that we are the main cause of this. We see the sea level rise, we see the changes in weather, we see the dry, the biodiversity, all oh, these pictures are just, you know, giving an indication of what is all that is being affected by global warming, which is a result of our activities. Let's look at the history of climate change processing. We see that it is not until the late 70s that countries began to become concerned on human activities leading to warmer of the lower atmosphere. This was basically a, a result of some scientists. But before the late 70s, as early as in the 1800, scientists have realized that temperature changes. Temperature can grow, temperature can decrease, which means it can get hot, it can get cold. And that was the beginning of understanding weather. Then led to the International Meteorological Organization, which later on, uh, after the World uh, War, it was renamed to World Meteorological Organization. And the World Meteorological Organization organized some uh, climate conference. And it was in this conference that the World Meteorological Organization, together with the uh, United Nations Environmental Program established the Intergovernmental Climate Change Panel, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was established to investigate and report on the scientific evidence on climate change, which will lead up to confirming the concerns that human activities are leading to the warming of the lower atmosphere. And then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is basically an organization of scientists and governments. They don't do research. They just collect all the available research information data that is there and they simply synthesize it. And then they call on the governments, governments to adopt it. The first report of the IPCC, which came in around 1990, confirmed that yes, human activities are leading to the warming of the Earth's surface. It was then that the United Nations General Assembly took a decision a resolution to establish an intergovernmental committee, frame a convention on climate change, which was mandated to negotiate a convention. This intergovernmental committee for a frame a convention on climate change negotiated around 1990, 1991 for this con convention until uh, in 1992, during the Rio Earth Convention in Brazil, where the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted and open to signatures. This environmental convention was adopted with two others, which was the biodiversity and the desertification. Now, moving on, 
let's see how the UNFC will see the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement are framed to tackle climate change. We know that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which we normally term the convention, remains the foundation of multilateral actions to combat climate change, which is a global action, and its impact on human and the ecosystem. The Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement builds upon the convention. They are actually negotiated by the parties of the convention and then adopted by the parties of the convention. When I say parties of the convention, we basically mean uh, what we refer to as the climate change conference. We have got what we call it conference, climate change conference of parties, which is abbreviated as COP. And then we've got conference, climate change conference meeting as parties to the Kyoto Protocol, which we call it CMP, and as meeting of the Paris Agreement, call it CMA. We will get this development further in our work. Uh, these are distinct and separate treaties, which are, which are governing bodies and they have their own memberships. They've got their own membership, but closely related. Now, over the years since 1995, climate change regime has been constantly undergoing reviews, adjustment in response to new or changing circumstances and scientific information. You will recall that we talked about the IPCC, that it was tasked to confirm that human activities do interfere with the climate system. The IPCC went on to produce another report, a number of reports. I think now they are in number six. They are working on number six. And these reports have been looking into mitigation, have been looking into adaptation, have been looking into the science of the climate and climate change, and continuously advising the Conference of Climate Change, which is a major body that takes decision. Now, the, the parties established texts of the convention. Like I said, it's framed such that there's the preamble where they are citing, you know, and then there's the principle and provisions which will come to it later. And then there's the commitment where parties are committing to reducing emissions as well as coping with the impact of climate change. But for this to happen, there's a need for means of implementation, which are also negotiated. Now the means of implementation, they encompasses finance, which is needed to help developing countries to take their climate actions, technology, which is needed to assist developing countries to reduce their emissions, and the capacity building, which is also needed to build capacity within the institutions, the government, and everybody to be able to develop policies that will help the globe to tackle climate change. Now, let's move on now and focus to the convention, the UNF. Triple C. We say this is primarily the principal body to attack. This is a legal instrument which has established general principles, obligations, institutional infrastructure for negotiations. Like I said, that there is institutional arrangement. And it also adopts any supplemental legal instrument for a specific action on climate change. We know that it has adopted the Kyoto Protocol. We know that it has adopted the Paris Agreement. And we know that they are, they are building upon it. It is procedural. 
with broad latitudes for countries to choose national policies and measures to combat climate change. Countries develop their own national policies, they develop their own measures. And we will see this as we go on with our lesson, especially in chapter in the next stage when we're looking at lesson module three, where we're now focusing on the national policies and measures that are taken by governments to combat climate change. It has got principle. And one of the principles is act in interest of human activity, even with insufficient scientific evidence. It adopted this principle from the Montreal Protocol that we must act even though there is not enough scientific evidence to support our action because it has already been confirmed. It also has another principle that we understand that response to climate change needs everybody, you know, everyone is affected by climate change. But we, we need to act, all of us. But how do we act, all of us? Then it sets a principle that we should act in accordance with our common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. We've got different responsibilities, we've got different capabilities. We are different countries, some are developed, some are developing, some are least developed. So that this principle is actually allowing these parties to work together, even if they have those different responsibility and respective uh, capabilities. This is mainly trying to make sure that there is equity even though it's very difficult to define equity in terms of fear. So what is the ultimate objective of this uh, climate change convention? It is basically to stabilize the greenhouse gas concentration. You remember when we dealt with climate, uh, we dealt with the greenhouse effect, we talked about greenhouse gas concentration. So this ultimate objective is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference. Anthropogenic is human interference with the climate system. We've already defined what is the climate system. So we know what is, where is the interference. And such a level should be achieved within a time frame. We have to take note of these two uh, words, level, time frame. Time frame sufficient to allow ecosystem to adapt naturally to climate change. So that we also ensure that food security is not threatened and enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. What do we notice about the ultimate objective? We know that it doesn't state the level. What will be the level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference? It doesn't state it. It also doesn't state the time frame, which will be sufficient for ecosystem to adapt naturally and to ensure that food security is not threatened and to allow economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. Now, the time frame and the level, this is what needs to be negotiated because there is no one time frame because we, 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 we have different responsibilities. We have, we have different levels of emission. So we need to negotiate this time frame based on the global emission. The convention moves on to commit developing countries to take the lead. These are the industrialized countries. We know that during the industrial revolution, there was a lot of emissions that were introduced, I mean, greenhouse gases that were introduced into the atmosphere. So they must do more to reduce the greenhouse gases. But it also recognized, the conference also recognized that while emissions from developing countries to grow, countries has to grow, while their emissions are still very low, it still has to grow to support the economic development and poverty eradication. 
while recognizing the need for adaptation. Because these countries, they are very much prone to the effects of climate change. The convention further established a financial and technological mechanism, which is supposed to support developing countries. Now, the commitments are negotiated. The established mm -hmm. financial mechanism and the technology is committed. And then it went on to establish a capacity building initiative. And once again, call upon governments to educate, empower, engage all stakeholders on policies related to climate change, which is education, uh, training, public awareness, public information on climate issues. Now, it puts upon all the countries to develop policies on national inventories. They are inventories of gas emissions, GHG emissions. How much the country is emitting from the various sectors and must report on mitigation policies and measures. Again, this convention plays the lead on developing countries. So basically, the convention, as we have said, it's got no legally binding instrument. It doesn't define the level. It doesn't define the time frame. So during the first meeting of the conference of the parties to the convention, they realized that they need to start negotiating for a new treaty. And of course, they have the powers to adopt a new treaty as it's defined in the text. So then they started negotiating the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol now is a legally binding instrument. It sets qualified economy-wide reduction targets. Now we have got targets for developed countries and there are no targets for developing countries in the Kyoto Protocol. It's only developed countries. And to assist in this target in reducing the emission, it sets three flexible mechanisms. The clean development mechanism, which is basically uh, there for developing countries to a trade with developed countries on the emissions that they have. And then there's a joint implementation, which is between two developed countries. And then there's emission trading, which can be taken by any country whereby you can trade. They can trade, you know, they can sell their emissions, they can buy emissions and so forth. Now, in order to make sure that there is emission reduction target, it has to set a monitoring, a robust monitoring review and verification process, which will be implemented for developed country parties commitment. So when the developed country parties commitment uh, communicate their greenhouse gas reduction, uh, their policies, their measures, they have to be reviewed. The data, the information that is used must be reviewed, it must be verified in order to ensure that there is a reduction uh, uh, of emission in the attack. So in order to do that, then it means they are national communication. National communication is where they report about the policies and measures to reduce the emission. It must be subject to a third part review process, which has to be undertaken by expert review. These experts are part of the government. They are normally nominated and trained to do that. Well, the Kyoto Protocol commits countries to a mission of about 5% within a period 
from 2008 to 2005. That was the first commitment period. And the levels must be the 1990 level. The mission targets for the Kyoto Protocol cover six cases. That's the carbon dioxide, the methane, the nitrogen, hexafluoride, perosfluoride, and sulfofluoride. I'm sorry for quick saying these names. Sometimes the pronunciation is not very easy of these cases, and unless you've done them for so many times. But for very soon it was clear that the commitment period of 2008 to 2012 leave us. Uh, in a situation whereby we will still have the problem. So the parties then decided to negotiate for a second commitment, which was from 2013 to 2020. Unfortunately, during the negotiations, we reached 2020 before the second commitment was adopted. But now it has come into force. Obviously, there's little chance for a third commitment period following the adoption of the Paris Agreement. Now, moving on in the diagram, now we see a simple comparison of the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Of course, the Paris Agreement is still going to talk about uh, the Kyoto Protocol, is just talk about it, but it will help you to just go through and look at uh, uh, what is saying as we go to. As we talk about the Paris Agreement, you will have some, some form of uh, uh, understanding of the differences. Now, coming to the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement has come out as a landmark agreement to combat climate change. I think the parties were so excited that maybe at last we've got one that probably will work for us all, not necessarily for a, a few countries. And they believe that this will help to accelerate and satisfy actions, climate actions, and promote investment needed for sustainable low carbon emission pathways. Because we have to go to low carbon emission pathways. There are some countries who still need to grow their emission. Again, it builds upon the convention and brings all nations, all government, to a common cause of undertaking ambitious effort to combat climate change and adapt to the, its effect with support to developing countries to take climate change, especially financial support. The Paris Agreement is guided by three goals. The first goal is to hold temperature, global average temperature increase to well below two degrees above Brenda's level, while pursuing effort to limit the increase to 1.5. It also established a goal to adapt to the adverse effect of climate change and foster climate resilience and low carbon emission development in line with the temperature goal. The third goal is financial flows, which will be consistent with pathways towards low carbon emission, climate change, and resilient development. So this flow, this finance must be in such a way that it is also in line with the global average temperature goal, the adaptation goal to make sure that, that climate actions, they increase uh, the level of ambition while making sure that all actions are taken to address or combat climate change. The Paris Agreement recognized that the best available knowledge and science should be the basis of effective and progressive response to the threat of climate change. So now we're beginning to see that the Paris Agreement is recognizing scientific knowledge. Of course, after so many release of reports from the IPCC, it means the process has been going reviews, uh, you know, adjustment, based on such information. It also recognized that we need to safeguard food and end hunger. It also recognized that for ambitious goals, 
mobilize and provide provision of financial resources, new technology framework, and has capacity building is core. And you also recognize the importance of sinks and reservoir climate crisis. Sinks are basically those elements that absorbs uh, greenhouse gases, such as forests and reservoir are also forest or you know carbon sequestration. You know, those are terminology that we, you will get to know them as you get more involved in the process. And then calls upon all parties to do their best domestic effort and produce progressive national determined contribution which is basically their measures and policies on how to mitigate, how to adapt, kind of support that is provided or received. It all comes into this report. It then realized that it is important now to welcome all efforts from non-stakeholders addressing climate change. Non-stakeholders basically, it means civil society, which are basically non-government organization, a business community, a municipal, a insurance, a banks. They are all doing certain efforts to combat climate change. And now in order to see the overall picture, the process needs to take on board their efforts so that when we're doing measurements and reporting, we will be able to see if we're progressively uh, addressing climate change. Well, this is the famous uh, Paris Agreement, you know, which was adopted at COP21, uh, the temperature, uh, average global temperature to be well below two degrees and efforts which will be made to keep it 1.5. And we see at the conference, there was a lot of excitement when it was adopted. Now we talk about institutional bodies. We said that there should be institutional bodies uh, to do this with uh, the conference of the parties which the COP, the CIMAP, uh, I'll go quickly at this point in time, just to make sure that I keep in time. Uh, we promote effective implementation and administration and institutional decision under the president. The president is always nominated from every COP. COP are taking place every year. And every year, the parties nominate a president. The conference of the parties, which at this point, there are three, in nature. We have the COP, which is the convention with the CMP, which is the KP, with the CMA, which is the Paris Agreement. They are mandated to review the implementation and any other legal instrument and adopt and take decision for effective implementation. We have presiding officers. And presiding officers are those officers like the, the president, uh, the chair of the established bodies, subsidiary bodies, which provide crucial assistance to the president in management and they conduct, they're basically conducting the intergovernmental negotiation. Well, this chart gives you a simple flow as to how do we move from a non-legal binding instrument to the Kyoto Protocol. And then when you go to the Kyoto Protocol, how do we try to make sure that everybody got involved until we go to the failed Copenhagen COP in Denmark. And then how do we pick up from there to eventually come up with the a Paris Agreement? All this take place with the subsidiary bodies, which is the subsidiary body for implementation and the subsidiary body for science and technology, which facilitates the negotiations and they meet twice a year. This process have got a COP Bureau, uh, which are representative of the UN regional group. We'll hear about this regional group later on. They are elected at the plenary by the COP and uh, they 
basically there to assist uh, the president in managing the process. Representative of the least countries is allowed to attend as observer. But at any point in time, when a member of the party is not a member of the Kyoto Protocol Representative Agreement, there is always a replacement during meetings when items or agenda items of the Kyoto Protocol are being considered as well as agenda items of the Paris Agreement. The Bureau basically deals with process management and support the work of the COPS conferences. They give advice and guidance regarding ongoing work, organization of sessions, support to the secretary. And during section, they provide process, and they, they assist with process management and support the president's staff and also act as intelligent agents to the other bodies. The conference established two permanent bodies. And this is the subsidiary board for science and technological advice and the subsidiary body for implementation. Both bodies save all the treaties, the KP and the PA. The substar provides the conferences and other subsidiary bodies that may be established in the process with timely information and advice on science and technology. Whereas the SBI assists the conferences in the assessment and review of effective implementation of the climate treaties. The COP designated the global environmental facilities and the green climate change as entities for financial mechanism as it's established a financial mechanism as well. And also uh, the global environmental facilities administer the special climate fund which is fund for climate for developing countries and the least development country fund, which is su support for uh, least developing countries. The, the, the process is supported by the secretariat, which is headed by the executive secretary. And this is the board that prepares all documents of the conference meeting. Should there be meetings of the subsidiary bodies or meetings of the conferences? The conferences meet once a year, the subsidiary board meets twice, one in the mid year and another meeting together with the meeting of the conferences. There are other international organization which is helping in advancing implementation of the climate change regime. The climate change convention understand that to promote its implementation, it needs to call upon COP to seek a neutralized service and cooperation of an information for private by competent international organizations like the IPCC, which I've mentioned earlier on, the biodiversity, the United Nations Environmental Program. And in addition to that, some of the international organization cooperation with the COP includes the IPCC I've mentioned, International Civil Aviation Organization, we know that airlines, they, they, they use, they burn a lot of fossil fuel. So it means they are contributing to the increase on the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. The International Maritime Organization, we know very well that the marine is also, they also burn a lot of fuel, which means they contribute to the, the Food and Agricultural Organization, we've talked about methane, as much as we need to make sure that food, we secure food and we avoid hunger, we also need to understand that we need to reduce emission while at the same time adapt in the agricultural sector. This leads me to the end. I thank you very much. Please take a quiz so that we can now move on to the next stage of our training which will be lesson module three and four. I thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you.